That Lean and Hungry Look by Suzanne Britt Jordan. Caesar was right. Thin people need watching. I've been watching them for most of my adult life, and I don't like what I see. When these narrow fellows spring at me, I quiver to my toes. Thin people come in all personalities, most of them menacing. You've got your together thin person, your mechanical thin person, your condescending thin person, your tisk-tisk thin person, your efficiency expert thin person. All of them are dangerous. In the first place, thin people aren't fun. They don't know how to goof off, at least in the best fat sense of the word. They've always got to be doing. Give them a coffee break and they'll jog around the block. Supply them with a quiet evening at home and they'll fix the screen door and lick green stamps. They say things like, there aren't enough hours in the day. Fat people never say that. Fat people think the day is too damn long already. Thin people make me tired. They've got speedy little metabolisms that cause them to bustle briskly. They're forever rubbing their bony hands together and eyeing new problems to tackle. I like to surround myself with sluggish, inert, easygoing fat people, the kind who believe that if you clean it up today, it'll just get dirty again tomorrow. Some people say the business about the jolly fat person is a myth, that all of us chubbies are neurotic, sick, sad people. I disagree. Fat people may not be chortling all day long, but they're a hell of a lot nicer than the wizened and shriveled. Thin people turn surly, mean, and hard at a young age because they never learn the value of a hot fudge sundae for easing tension. Thin people don't like gooey soft things because they themselves are neither gooey nor soft. They are crunchy and dull like carrots. They go straight to the heart of the matter while fat people let things stay all blurry and hazy and vague the way things actually are. Thin people want to face the truth. Fat people know there is no truth. One of my thin friends is always staring at complete unsolvable problems and saying, the key thing is, fat people never say things like that. They know there isn't any such thing as the key thing about anything. Thin people believe in logic. Fat people see all sides. The sides fat people see are rounded blobs, usually gray, always nebulous, and truly not worth worrying about. But the thin person persists. If you consume more calories than you burn, says one of my thin friends, you will gain weight. It's that simple. Fat people always grin when they hear statements like that. They know better. Fat people realize that life is illogical and unfair. They know very well that God is not in his heaven and all is not right in the world. If God was up there, fat people could have two donuts and a big orange drink anytime they wanted it. Thin people have a long list of logical things they are always spouting off to me. They hold up one finger at a time as they reel off these things so I won't lose track. They speak slowly as if to a young child. The list is long and full of holes. It contains tidbits like get a grip on yourself, cigarettes kill, cholesterol clogs, fit as a fiddle, ducks in a row, organize, and sound fiscal management. Phrases like that. They think these 2,000 point plans lead to happiness. Fat people know happiness is elusive at best, and even if they could get the kind thin people talk about, they wouldn't want it. Wisely, fat people see that such problems are too dull, too hard, too off the mark. They will never be better than a whole cheesecake. Fat people know all about the mystery of life. They are the ones acquainted with the night, with luck, with fate, with playing it by ear. One thin person I once knew suggested that we arrange all the parts of the jigsaw puzzle into groups around the size, shape, and color. We figured this would cut out the time needed to complete the puzzle by at least 10%. I said I wouldn't do it. Me, I like to muddle through. Two, what good would it do to finish early? Three, the jigsaw puzzle isn't the important thing. The important thing is the fun of four people, one thin person included, sitting around a card table working on a jigsaw puzzle. My thin friend had no use for my list. 
Instead of joining us, he went outside and mulched the boxwoods. The three remaining fat people finished the puzzle and made chocolate double fudge brownies to celebrate. The main problem with thin people is they oppress. Their good intentions, bony and torsos, tight ships, neat corners, cerebral machinations, and pat solutions loom like dark clouds over the loose, comfortable, spread out, soft world of the fat. Long after fat people have removed their coats and shoes and put their feet up on the coffee table, thin people are still sitting on the edge of the sofa, looking neat as a pin, discussing rutabagas. Fat people are heavily into fits of laughter, slapping their thighs and whooping it up, while thin people are still politely waiting for the punchline. Thin people are downers. They like math and morality and reasoned evaluation of the limitations of human beings. They have their skinny little acts together. They expose, prognose, probe, and prick. Fat people are convivial. They will like you even if you're irregular and have acne. They will come up with a good reason why you never wrote the great American novel. They will cry in your beer with you. They will put your name in the pot. They will let you off the hook. Fat people will gab, giggle, guffaw, galump, gyrate, and gossip. They are generous, giving, and gallant. They are gluttonous and goodly and great. What you want when you're down is soft and jiggly, not muscled and stable. Fat people know this. Fat people have plenty of room. Fat people will take you in. Okay, so let's dive into Suzanne Jordan Britt's uh, That Lean and Hungry Look. Um, as we talk about this essay, uh, as we've been moving through essays, now we're into another type. Um, this is what we call a compare and contrast essay. Um, and let's, let's just talk about that term first, compare and contrast. Um, usually when you are given the task of comparing or contrasting ideas, uh, we conflate them. We say that you have to do both. Um, this actually causes you to make some, some difficult choices inside of writing um, where now you're less targeted than if you just wrote a comparison or just wrote a contrast. So one thing I want you to know kind of going in is we are conditioned as people to do certain things in certain ways. When we do a comparison, we usually do a contrast in our minds as well. Uh, it's kind of a natural process that we go through. But you're actually just making a decision. You're actually not making a decision by kind of just doing the norm uh, when you write a compare-contrast essay. So you could write just a comparison essay or you could write just a contrast essay. Um, I would argue that Brit's um, Lean and Hungry look is really a contrast essay more than it is anything else. She's not really drawing a lot of comparisons between skinny people and fat people. She's drawing way more contrast. And I think that's really on purpose. Uh, the other thing to talk about here is what structure. So we are used to, when we write a compare and contrast of any kind, basically making two columns and keeping the columns separate. Whether you're writing that pro-con list of whether you should do this action or go to this college or whatever else, um, or whether you're writing, you know, a kind of five paragraph essay where you say like, here's my introduction, I'm introducing the overall topic, here's my comparison, uh, you know, paragraphs, here are my contrast paragraphs, and now here's my conclusion, here's what we should think at the end of this. Um, it's still the same thing. So what Brit accomplishes here that's pretty impressive, just from a structural standpoint, is she is just layering in Thin person, fat person, thin person, fat person, thin person, fat person. Uh, by the way, I should say I don't usually use the term fat person unless I am talking about this essay because I feel like it's important to use her language. Um, and that word is very controversial and she's using that word on purpose, right? Um, so that's something else when you get into the small groups and you start having this conversation about like, well, is this an offensive essay? Is it intentionally offensive? Um, what is offensive about it? What offended me? Um, you're going to find a variety of different things that are very offensive here. Um, I'll just kind of get the ball rolling by talking about myself. I'm currently overweight. I've been overweight for a little while. Um, 
part of that is my fault and part of it's not because of health conditions. Um, and yet there are many more things that I appreciate about the skinny person perspective in this essay than the fat person perspective. I am definitely a planner. Give me an evening off and I will definitely maybe not re repair my screen door, but I'm going to read a book or I'm going to, uh, you know, make a video lesson or, or do something. I actually uh, really don't like feeling non-productive when I'm, when I'm at home, I have to have some kind of productivity. Um, it seems like I can't even take a day off. So I definitely fit a lot of the skinny person criteria. Um, and then I fit some of the fat person criteria. So should I be offended uh, by one or those other ideas? That becomes a, an interesting question. Um, that's going to bring up this question of audience. So who do you think her audience is? Um, and it's going to get me to introducing this idea of satire for you guys. Uh, because this is a satirical piece and we're going to read some more satirical pieces, I just want us to be aware that satirical pieces, their, their aim is to offend, right? Um, and if you are offended by a piece of writing, do you think you would continue reading it? Um, the answer is probably no, uh, especially with reading. seems like it's really, really easy to put down a piece of writing that is contrary to you or pointing out your faults. You just have to ignore it, put it away. Most people don't read beyond the headlines anyway, so why are you even bothering? Um, so satire, while it is making fun of people to accomplish a purpose, um, one of the, the problems is that people probably won't read it. Um, if you were genuinely offended by this article, uh, again, we're going to inspect why, but uh, would you have kept reading it if it wasn't for class? Probably not. So just thinking about how specific, how sharp is that audience uh, with satire, it's very, very sharp uh, and it will cut the other side and they won't appreciate it so they don't respond. So we'll talk more about satire as we kind of move on and that's a good uh, point of question for you for live sessions and things like that. Um, so we talked about audience, we talked about um, structure. So what's her purpose? What is she trying to get out of this whole example? Um, that's another thing that I really want you to talk about inside of groups. Like what is her overarching purpose? Um, and start thinking about some of the other issues that you're probably um, you know, really thinking about in your daily lives anyway. Um, body issues and body health are really, really uh, valuable. It's a conversation that um, ha has kind of penetrated our society and we've, we've been having these conversations, uh, I mean, really since I was a teenager, maybe a little before that, um, in the early 90s, I think is when that really started to become an issue and we started to kind of really pay attention to body issues. Um, and they haven't really gone away. Like we, we hear a lot of health articles. We hear a lot of, uh, you know, dialogue around the conversation of how should we portray people, but we don't always do a good job with that. Um, one article that I read recently that I'll try to tag on here in some way, uh, just talked about male actors and how um, to, to get that really Greek godlike physique that you see like Chris Hemsworth and Hugh Jackman uh, sporting in, in their superhero movies uh, takes this ungodly effort, um, you know, six days a week of training, uh, really closely working with dietitians. Um, you know, they're paid to be that way. In fact, uh, the Hugh Jackman one, he talks about like, when I know my shirtless date is, he's got to know that three months in advance because he's got to, even though he is a, a very healthy jacked person, he's got to plan three months in advance how to get down to a cut weight. And he says the last 24 hours is basically dehydrating himself just so he can get the, the muscly look that he's supposed to have. Um, that is not a, that's not a thing most people should ever have to do. It's arguably not a thing anyone should have to do. But then we see that image, right? And we're like, that's a very attractive body. Uh, but we don't realize like, oh, that's really not an attainable goal. Um, you have to, you have to be paid to have a body like that. And you have to do a whole lot of work under very close supervision, 
Um, and it's not even healthy. It's You shouldn't dehydrate yourself for a whole day. Um, so certainly a lot of talking points around this essay and what is her purpose. And I'm going to leave that for you guys to, uh, to chat about.